I want you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. This is where we're studying right now. 1 Peter chapter 2. And our study tonight will be from the first three verses of this chapter. 1 Peter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, Apple TV keyboard. Aside, Apple TV keyboard. All malice, keyboard input. All Enter text on your Apple TV using your iOS keyboard. Press two type. Envy and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I have made reference numerous times from this pulpit to that little rule of when you read the word therefore, find out what it's there for. And it is significant in this particular case because it's the first word of a chapter. And this illustrates to us how unfortunate it is that these chapter divisions will mislead us sometimes or keep us from making proper connections. The Apostle Peter had already been writing, and now he says, therefore, and obviously this that he's about to write is in reference to that which has already preceded. And in three lessons now, I have spoken to you about the first chapter. And let me sort of summarize that first chapter if, with four points. Four things in the first chapter to which Peter obviously makes reference. One of them being that your heavenly Father is your judge, and he is an impartial judge at that. Secondly, that you were redeemed from sin in the same fashion that a slave might be bought out of slavery and given his freedom from slavery, you were bought and redeemed from the slavery to sin. But you were bought and redeemed by that which is more precious than even silver and gold, the blood of Jesus Christ. Third, Peter tells us <clears throat> that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Your souls were contaminated. Your souls were spotted with sin. And you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth. And finally, he says, you therefore are born again. It's like you have a new birth, a new start. And that new birth or that being born again comes about not by the corruptible seed as like in a fleshly union of man and woman, but by the incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God. And therefore, you see, and therefore, you see where you are? You're a child of God. Your heavenly Father is your judge, but he's an impartial judge. And in view of that, you pass your time, the time of your sojourning or your traveling on a foreign field with fear, with godly fear. And remember that you were redeemed with a priceless, precious blood of Jesus, that you are born again, and this is the setting in which you are. You've purified your soul here on earth and you're now prepared to go to heaven. Therefore, lay aside these things. <clears throat> now look at, <clears throat> in verse 1, laying aside. Now let me illustrate it in this way. Here is a little booklet that I have from my library. When I walked to the stand tonight to begin my lesson, I had it in my hand, and I laid it aside and kept it there. And it'll, it'll stay there. It will stay there until I am ready to use it. 
and then I will take it up and use it. That's not what Peter said here. The word that he used here would be this way. I take this book, I'm through with it, I have no further use of it, and I throw it in the garbage for it to be picked up and totally destroyed and recycled somewhere. This laying aside is from the Greek that means <clears throat> a one-time, once-for-all, definite action. These are not things you're going to lay aside until later. You're going to do away with them for good. Now what are they? Malice. And by malice, Peter is talking about that evil disposition that someone can have toward another person that produces a desire to hurt that person so that you say things or you do things or you give little suggestions that will cause people to think less of the person and to thus hurt the person. He said, lay aside all guile. And by guile, he's simply talking about deceitfulness. There are people who will deceive you. You may have been guilty of that in the past yourself. It's connected to the next one because he says hypocrisy, which is pretenses in which you pretend to be something that you're not, or you pretend to lack something that you don't, or you pretend to lack someone when you don't. You see, his whole group here is sort of a package. <coughs> Excuse me. It, the, the package is that he's talking about the kind of relationships that we have with each other that hurt us and hurt others. And we have to put that away. Don't be the kind of person that will pretend to like somebody and then turn around and hurt them. Turn around and talk about them. Look at the last one, evil speaking. That's slanderers or slanders. Brother Hugo McCord in his translation of the New Testament translates it that way, slanders. Put away slanderous remarks, things that you say about other people, and envy. That's where you're discontented at the fortune of another person. You can't stand it when somebody prospers more than you do, or somebody's awarded something and you're not, or somebody's honored more than you are. And so you try to cut them down, you try to find fault with them. Now see, on the negative side, he says that's what we have to put away of. Put away completely, once and for all, throw it away, <coughs> be done with it. <clears throat> well, that's all we're going to say about that tonight. I want us to concentrate on the next part. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word. Now the first key word to look at in that phrase is the word desire. It literally means, and it is translated this way in a number of translations, crave. You know how people crave things? There are people that crave cigarettes. There are people that crave certain foods. I'm craving cornbread tonight love to have a plate of cornbread and pinto beans. My wife makes the best cornbread in the world and I can just taste it. See, you, you crave certain things. You just kind of, you get hungry and you say, ooh boy, I'd love to. Well, Peter used a word here that says, be like that with the word of God. That you crave something. You really want something so bad that you could just, you just can't be satisfied until you get it. An insatiable appetite, never satisfied. What, what is it that we need here that we're supposed to crave? The milk of the word. Milk of the word. 
Now, the reason the word milk is used is because he's drawn the analogy of or the comparison of a baby. Music recognition button. And just like a Double baby tap in open controls. gets nourishment from milk, and the baby born doesn't have all of the functions that he will one day have, but that one thing he's born with is to let you know when he's hungry. And he gets hungry, and that hunger has to be satisfied. So he's saying, like that newborn baby that desires nourishment, you need to desire nourishment, strength, food from God, from God's Word. Next phrase, do you see it? That you may grow thereby. You see, he said, this is the way that you grow. as a Christian through the Word. We develop spiritually through the Word. Now listen to these passages. Romans 10, 17, Paul said, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing with the Word of God. My faith needs to be greater, and so does yours. Because I don't know of any of us that has a faith that is full grown. But the way to make that faith greater is through the Word. David said in Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What does the Word do? Builds up an immunity. It doesn't mean that you won't be subjected to temptation, but you won't yield to the temptation because of the strength that is there. <clears throat> when you went last fall and took that flu shot, that didn't mean you would not be subjected to the germs that would have given you the flu, but it just gave your body what was needed, hopefully, to ward off those germs. You mothers and fathers take those little babies and you get those immunizations. That doesn't mean they're not going to be exposed to those diseases, but their body will have built up a strength and an immunity to ward it off. And that's what the Word of God does for us regarding sin and temptation and advances from the devil. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I won't sin against you. And in Psalm 119, verse 104, David said, Through thy precepts, that is, through your laws, I get understanding. And therefore, I hate every false way. I get this. It was through the laws of God and the Word of God that David said he had understanding, obviously, of what was right, and therefore he hated every false way. He knew what the true ways were and therefore hated the false ways. But how did he first know <coughs> what the true ways were? Through the Word. In that passage of Scripture that Jim read for us earlier, Peter said, You, you, therefore, beloved, beware, lest you also, being led away by the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to show you something. Turn your Bibles to Acts the 20th chapter. <coughs> Acts chapter 20.
in the latter part of this chapter, we have the record of Paul with the Ephesian elders. And oh, what an awful responsibility. What an awesome responsibility elders of the church have to protect the flock, to keep the church pure from false teaching, from things that would cause people to be lost out of the church. And Paul gave these Ephesian elders some parting. He knew he would never see them again. He gave them these parting words. Read with me from verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now do you see the danger that he alerts them to? He's already spoken to them about it. He says, see that word therefore again in verse 31? Therefore, watch, therefore, remember. See, that he, he's telling them, that's why for three years I didn't stop warning you. Warn? Yeah. That's a part of preaching, is to warn people, to let them know of dangers that are out there. That's a part of it. And he said, I did this for three years in tears. Well, you've got to appreciate a preacher that cares enough about you to warn you of dangers, and especially if he does it with tears in his eyes. And he says to these elders, it's going to come from outside, and it's going to come from inside the church. But I'm not through. Now, in view of what he's just warned them about and told them that he spent three years warning them about, watch his next sentence in verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. To what did he direct them? To what did he make his appeal in view of the dangers? The word of his grace. So what did Peter say about it? Like a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Look back at verse 32 now. I commend you to, the, to God and the word of his grace which is able to build you up. See the parallel between build you up and grow? Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. I commend you to God in the word of his grace which is able to build you up. There's a strength that is received through a study of the word. <clears throat> there is a building up process, a growing, a developing process through the word. I want to say some things to you tonight in these last few moments. It's not the first time you've heard this. And it won't be the last. And that's because I have a responsibility to God. The brethren... There are a lot of things going on in the religious world, including the church, that are dangerous, spiritually dangerous to people in the church. I mentioned earlier the new hermeneutics. 
I've warned you before. Alan Hires in that videotape warned you. And I will warn you again that there are people in our brotherhood who seem set on changing the way we look at the Bible, the way we read and interpret the Bible and make application of it. And behind that, apparently, though it may not be a conscious thing, is this desire to have women in leadership roles, for some of them are on record as saying they'd have no problem appointing a woman to the eldership. They'd have no problem appointing a woman to the position of the pulpit. And there are women who'd have no problem being in those positions. And this is not an anti-woman statement, but it's as wrong as it can be. God's Word doesn't authorize it. Mechanical music is another area. There are those that seem set on, somehow or another, bringing this into our worship. And I don't have time nor even inclination tonight to go into all of the details of how that might be done. But mechanical music and worship to God is unscriptural. It has been since the first century. It is unscriptural today and will continue to be unscriptural. God's word has not changed about that. But there are people teaching that it's okay. All right, now think of another thing. I mentioned earlier the conversation with that preacher and we discussed divorce and remarriage. You might be interested in knowing <clears throat> that that's not an isolated case. That I frequently come across preachers and teachers, members of the church, who believe that you can be married four or five times, and then when you learn the gospel, you can obey the gospel and be saved and stay with the mate you have at that time, even though you didn't have a Bible cause for your divorces and remarriages. Such is wrong. It's contrary to God's word. Jesus doesn't authorize that, doesn't permit it in Matthew 19.9 and Matthew 5.32. But my point needs to be extended to recent current events. With all of that, all the war that raged in the Middle East and in the Gulf, we heard a lot of talk and we read a lot in the newspapers, even from the news people, not just the preachers, but from the news people there was a lot of talk about the Battle of Armageddon, the rapture, the second coming of Christ, and the return of the Jews to Palestine and so on. It all had to do with premillennialism, a false doctrine. And I heard, not necessarily here, but from our brotherhood, I heard a lot of people in the church who expressed a faith in that. It indicated they had embraced that, they believed that. My point is this, truth is that which saves, error is that which damns. Truth is absolute and is attainable. Error will lead you away from God, away from salvation. Now you can stay religious and be an error. 
You can come to church and still be an arrow. Deceived, deluded, but lost in error. And I know that there are some areas that we have to classify as areas of opinion and personal judgment about which we do not have to agree. But beloved, not a one of the topics of, that I've made reference to tonight are in those categories. And people cannot believe error about mechanical music and then be led off into worshiping with mechanical music and be pleasing to God in their worship. And a person cannot be led into error <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> about divorce and remarriage. A person cannot be led into error about that. And then practice that error and live in adultery and go to heaven. It can't happen. So, it is compulsory then, it would seem to me, that you and I need to be diligent students of the book. Not taking the word of someone else about it. Not depending upon what we hear in a casual way in a Bible class, but diligently studying the book to know what the truth is. For if you do not know what truth is, how shall you determine what error is? I told you it's not the first time you've heard this and it won't be the last. Because I love you enough that I won't stop talking about it. Brother G.K. Wallace used to say you may be tired of hearing it but you're not through. I love you that much. And I mean it. But there are too many people in the church whose faith, whose religion, whose religious practices are based 99% on taking the word of somebody else. And there are too many, in my personal judgment, there are, there's far, far too much of our Bible study time that is not spent finding out what the truth is, but just an exchange of personal ideas and opinions. You see, people in the world who embrace error and practice error are lost. But beloved, if you're in the church and embrace error and practice error, you're lost too. That's how serious this is. Now what disturbed me so much about this preacher is here is a man who's been in the pulpit already for a number of years. <clears throat> he decided he needed some additional schooling and he is within a month of graduating from one of our graduate schools And in 20 minutes of talking to that man and asking him question after question, I could not get one single definitive answer from him about any of the basic matters about which I ask. Well, I'm still thinking through that. Well, that's a hard one to call. Now that's scary to think that we have preachers filling our pulpits that can't tell you what the Bible says about certain matters. They don't know about, he, he's not sure about adultery, divorce, and remarriage. And he said, and you remember I told you, he said, well, I just don't think that we can say we have the final word on the scripture about anything. 
Well, I do. I think we better. And that doesn't mean I'm closed-minded, that I'm not going to study anymore. But what about the rest of us? Right now, could you take your Bible and turn to the person nearest you and show that person in the Bible why we don't have a mechanical instrument of music in our worship? Could you take your Bible and in your Bible without any additional help show somebody, turn to the person nearest you and show them what a person has to do in order to be saved and give Bible for it? Could you open your Bible and show why we don't believe in the rapture, why we don't believe in the battle of Armageddon, why we don't believe the Jews have to return to Palestine in order to fulfill biblical prophecy? Could you open your Bible and show why? Do you yourself know why we don't have women preachers? Because you see, well, we've never had it that way. That doesn't work. That's not a sufficient reason. That's what this preacher was telling me. <laughs> he said, well, the new hermeneutics, I'm just, it seems like what we've had been working pretty good, so I guess maybe, you know, why anything? No, that's not a sufficient reason for anything. If there's a reason, where is it? What is it? Study the book. And know what the truth is. And it occurs to me that right here is a hookup or a link to one of the main reasons why you and I, that is the majority of us, are so hesitant to talk to people whom we consider to be wrong and lost. Because in our hearts, we're afraid we don't know the truth ourselves. We need to get in the book, folks. I'm pleading with you to be a diligent student of the Bible. Now, I'm not an alarmist. There are such in our world, of course. I don't think I am such. But there are two men who have distinguished themselves in our brotherhood that I do not consider by the wildest stretch of imagination of being alarmist. And I'm referring to Willard Collins and E. Claude Gardner, former presidents of David Lipscomb University and Fried Hardeman University, respectively. Those two men travel our brotherhood widely. They have contact with people from all over the church. I think it fair to say they have their finger on the pulse of the church. Separate from each other, not in collaboration, in other words, but separate from each other, both of those men in the last year have said that unless something happens to turn us around and get us back to the book, that the churches of Christ in their judgment are headed for a major, major apostasy and division over these very matters that I have mentioned specifically tonight. Now, don't you be an alarmist. Don't overreact, but react. I 
mean, what are these little boys and girls that you and I feel are so precious? What are they going to believe? And what's the church going to be like for them? We're going to give an account to God for this. For what we believe, what we teach, and what we practice. Lay aside. It's time to throw into the garbage malice, guile, deceit, pretensions, evil speakings, and so on. And crave the word that you may grow and be strong in the faith. Open your song books, please, to the number announced. Selected. Screen music recognition. Selected.